Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 16 and reading through verse 24. The King James text today reads, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time, to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Listen, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. If you bow your heads with me a moment, Master, Savior, Redeemer, and King, how we appreciate the presence of God in the house of the Lord today. How we love to commune with your spirit to feel the living presence of a very real and living God. Master, the word of God must go forth, and it must always go forth in power, in love. It must go forth with divine authority. It somehow must pass simply beyond our hearing, and it must find its way to the deepest corridor of our heart. Lord, that it might affect change in us, that it might challenge us to step up higher, to be more, to do more in you than we've ever been and we've ever done before. Anoint, O God, with holy fire, the preacher of the gospel. Touch the ear of every hearer. Lord, today cultivate the ground that is our heart that we might be prepared to receive with gladness the Word of God. Lord, that it might take root and spring forth and bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Talking to us today on the topic excuse me you know in the story that our Lord shared this day he talks about a man who made a great supper and he invited many now you know anybody who goes to the effort and the expense of creating a great supper is going to be inviting friends and acquaintances People he knows, people he does business with, people he respects and admires. And yet in our story today, one after another provides an excuse and asks 
the servant of this man upon receiving an invitation to this dinner party they asked this man if he might make excuse to the host so that they might be pardoned for their absence you know it never ceases to amaze me I've heard this passage preached on my whole life and it amazes me how often you hear preachers preach that this is a type of the kingdom of God. That God has invited people to respond to the gospel and believe. And that uh, there are those who make excuses and they don't respond to the gospel. They find some excuse for not believing and not obeying. And therefore the Lord goes to others. Wrong. 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 Where in this parable do you see Jesus use the words, the kingdom of heaven is like unto? You don't. This parable has nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. This is not about calling sinners to repentance and unbelievers refusing to believe and unbelievers refusing to accept the gospel and obey the gospel. No, 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 no. This story talks about the fact that God has prepared something for his people. God has provided something to the world. He has put something in the world. That is wonderful. He has prepared a feast, hallelujah, for us, for anyone who would partake of that feast. And that feast, listen to me, children, is served up every Sunday in the house of God. That is where the feast is served. That is where the food and the nourishment is provided. How do I know that to be true? Look at the tail end of the passage I read to you today. Look at exactly how it is worded. The word of God said in verses 23 and 24, Luke chapter 14, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in. Listen, that my house may be filled. Oh, hallelujah. That my house may be filled. Glory to God. I'm here to tell you, when you understand this good old-fashioned Holy Ghost religion, like I understand this good old-fashioned Holy Ghost religion, there is no place in the world you'd rather be than in the house of God. I grew up in an old-time Pentecostal church up in New England. Honey, I'm going to tell you, even when I was a kid, my father was not a believer. He loved to put every roadblock in front of his wife and kids that he could put in front of us. Everything he could do to hinder us from being able to be in church and go to church, my father would do. During the school year, my father would tell my mother, the boys have to go to, church, uh, to school Monday morning. They don't need to be going with you to church on Sunday night. Now, mind you, my father spent more time away from home than most men. If he wasn't working overtime, he was having an affair with some woman. But somehow, my father, the demon that he was, would find a way to be home on Sunday night so that we boys couldn't go to church with mom on Sunday night. We'd have to stay home with my father and at bedtime he'd send us to bed and you know uh, we had relatively early bedtime so he was free all evening to do whatever he pleased but you know he loved to interfere 
with our going to church. I was knee high to a grasshopper, as they say. And I remember weeping and crying on my mother's knee because we couldn't go to church with her on Sunday night. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of kids who, man, they go to church with mom and dad and they're so bored. They're so, uh, you know, they get so fidgety. They want to play. They want to do stuff. They, they just can't sit still throughout the church service. That wasn't me. Oh, I went to church as a kid and oh, I'm going to tell you, oh, there was always something exciting happening. There was always something miraculous happening. There was always something wonderful happening. Sometimes an old drunk would wander in off the street. I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. Would wander in from off the street because we had a bar room down at the corner of our road. An old drunk would wander into the church and he'd sit at the back and during the whole song service he'd be poking at the lady in front of him and asking her questions and talking and interfering and interrupting. And at one point our pastor, kind of like old brother Charles, he didn't play too many games. And he just stopped everything and said, Sir, we are more than happy to have you with us in service, and we want you to stay. But you need to stop bothering those ladies and sit back and pay attention. And boy, that man just straightened up and sat back, you know. He took the rebuke. We finished our worship service. We shouted a little. We got happy a little. We made some noise like only Pentecostal people can make some noise. And then the pastor got up. Oh, and he preached. And he preached like this old preacher preaches. He actually preached like he believed what he was preaching. He actually preached with fire in his breast. He preached with passion. Like he had something important to say. And you needed to believe him. You needed to understand him. It was important. And at the end of that service, when the pastor offered the altar for anyone who wanted to begin a walk with God, anyone who wanted to be saved and know the Lord. And he opened up the altar and invited anyone who wanted to to come. Guess who went? That little old drunk sitting in the back of the church. And he went down to the front of the church and weeping, he knelt at the altar and people got around him and began to pray for him. I've seen drug addicts and drunks come into the church drunk as a skunk and as high as a kite. And when it come time for the altar, they make their way to the altar. And let me tell you what happened to them in the altar. They found Jesus. <laughs> they came into relationship with God. They turned from a life of unbelief to a life of faith and they repented and turned their life over to God and said, Lord, I've lived as an unbeliever, but from this day forward I vow to live as a believer. And God honored their faith and filled them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. And honey, when they got up from that altar, I kid you not, they were as sober as a judge. I can't count how many people I know who have received the gift of the Holy Ghost only to go home from church that night and never again have a taste for liquor. 
never again have a desire for illicit drugs. Many people have gone home from an experience with God and they no longer have any desire for cigarettes even. Oh, I want to tell you something today. Even as a child going to church, the house of God was a place of wonder. It was a place of amazement to me. I saw people's lives changed. I saw people healed as a child. I saw people healed regularly in our little tiny wood frame church that was probably about twice the size of the room we're in right now. That's all. I saw people healed. I saw people delivered. I saw people saved. Oh, I watched people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, honey, I'm going to tell you something. When you taste and see, as the Word of God says, taste and see that the Lord, He is good. Hallelujah. When you taste and see what this old time religion is really like. I'm not talking about the crap you see in churches today. I'm not talking about the politics. I'm not talking about the culture wars. I'm not talking about judging and condemning and criticizing everybody. Honey, let me tell you something. The old time religion I grew up in didn't include any of those things. All of that foolishness has been a relatively new development within the church world over the last 30 or 40 years. Growing up as a kid, my church taught us that we were to love everybody. It didn't matter if they were straight or gay. It didn't matter uh, what their situation in life. It didn't matter what we perceived as sin in their life. We were to love them and embrace them. And if somebody wanted to come into the house of God, whatever their life situation was, if they had a desire to be in the house of God, honey, we welcomed them with open arms. That's the kind of old time religion I grew up in. That's why I can still sing the old song. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. You remember the next part? Makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. And it's good enough for me. That's the truth. That is what the spirit-filled church used to look like many years ago. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. I went to the house of God, and if I couldn't find love at home, I could find it in the church house. If I couldn't get anybody to speak an encouraging word to me at home or in school, I could get it at the church house. If I couldn't find anybody who believed in me and supported me and encouraged me anywhere else on the planet, I could find it in the house of God. Oh, I want to tell you something. God has put a feast in this world for people who want to die. He has placed a glorious a meal in front of you folks I'm here to tell you here in Huntsville Alabama I don't care if you're straight gay or what you are or who you are this church is open to everybody every way we make a concerted effort to reach out to and to minister to LGBT people because we know that many churches make an ex uh, an, a special effort to exclude them and to push them away. Right. But that does not mean that we are exclusively an LGBT affirming church, not by a million miles. If you know how to love people like Jesus knew how to love people, you're welcome here. Amen. But I'm here to tell you something, Huntsville. God has put a feast in Huntsville. Oh, I'm here to tell you, he has prepared a feast 
in this city and you're missing out if you don't come and get you some of this. Hallelujah. Oh, when I was a kid, I wanted to pull up to the table and eat as often as I could. <laughs> I wanted to be in church as much as I could. I couldn't wait till the end of the school year, not because I was going to have all summer to go outside and play, but because all summer I was going to be able to go to church and my father had nothing to say about it. Hallelujah. I remember outpourings of the Holy Ghost in the church that I grew up in where the Spirit of the Lord came down in the church service. You ain't never felt love like you feel when God comes in the room. You never felt peace like you feel when Jesus walks into the church house. Oh, I want to tell you something. I've been in church our, our little church growing up as a kid, our Sunday night service began at 7 p.m. And I literally remember nights when we did not leave that church until 2 and 3 in the morning. And you know what? The next morning I woke up so energized. I woke up so excited. Oh, I'm telling you, there is something about being in the presence of a living God. There is something about experiencing the power and the glory of God. I mean, it does not wear you out. It does not tire you out. It does the exact opposite. It energizes you. It refreshes you. It renews you. Whew. I'd feel good all week. I'd be floating on air all week long. All because I was in the church house Sunday night and the Spirit of God came down and people were praying through to victory. People were praying through to the Holy Ghost. People were receiving miracles and being healed and saved. And even as a child, oh, it tasted good to me. <laughs> there was nowhere on earth I'd rather be. You know what? I'm 58 years old as of last week. And there is still nowhere I'd rather be than in the house of God. There is nothing still I'd rather see than somebody finding a relationship with Jesus Christ that brings them victory, that brings them deliverance, that brings them healing and salvation. My God, have mercy. The story that our Lord told this day in our primary text has nothing to do with being likened to the kingdom of God. No. It has to do with the fact that God has prepared something for his people. Well, I'll tell you, I've been warning the church ever since I was a kid. I've been prophesying, literally prophesying, since I was 12 years old or younger in the church I grew up in. I warned the church that I grew up in. That we better be careful or we're going to lose the presence of God. We better be careful or we're going to forfeit the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We better be careful. We better stay focused on spiritual things or we're going to wind up without the move of God that we have known for so many years. And do you know what I have? I have lived my life and I have watched the church over the last five decades as it has been in a steady, consistent state of decline. So that now, most Pentecostal, Spirit-filled, Holy Ghost baptized, full gospel churches you go into today, you can't tell the difference between them and First Presbyterian. power of God is gone the anointing is lacking the spirit of God does not descend upon the house of God there like it used to know because they're too busy preaching politics 
They're too busy preaching Trump to preach Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're too busy trying to change the world than to change the heart of an unbeliever to that of a believer. But that's our mission. God hasn't called us to change the world. He has called us to be a light in the world. And if we would be what God has called us to be, people would come to us. Mm -hmm. I don't know very many people who don't like light. The only people who don't like light are people who are doing wrong and they know they're doing wrong. If somebody is breaking into your house and a police car comes by and shines the spotlight on them as they're trying to break through your window or they're trying to push through your front door, they're not going to like the light because they know what they're doing is wrong and illegal and punishable by law, and I tell the truth. Oh, but I'm going to tell you, but there's a lot of people, if they're in a dark place, they're looking for a place where there's light. Your car breaks down on a long, lonely, dark road. You're afraid. The batteries died. The headlights aren't working. You're afraid. You begin to scan the landscape and you see slightly in the distance a home or a business and you see lights. And where do you go? Do you walk in the opposite direction further into the darkness? No. You're going to go toward the light. Am I telling the truth? I'll tell you, when God's church acts like God's church is supposed to act, people will come to the light. Jesus said, And if I be lifted up from the earth... I will draw all men unto me. The reason people are repelled by Christianity today, rather than being drawn to Christ, they are literally being turned from Christ and pushed away, is because the church no longer knows how to lift him up high. Hallelujah. Instead of preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, they're preaching everything that has to do with this world, everything that has to do with politics, everything that has to do with culture. Honey, wake up. The word of God said in the last days, wicked men shall wax worse and worse. You are an idiot if you do not understand that things are going to get worse in the world. But if the church will act like the church is supposed to act, then the church will be a place of refuge. It will be a place of refreshing. It will be a feast in the middle of a world of famine and disaster. But the church has to act right. God's put an old time, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, spitting, stomping, snorting preacher in Huntsville, Alabama. And some people might look and say, I don't care for that kind of preaching. I don't care for that kind of preacher. I, that's not my kind of church. Well, that's okay. You know what? Not everybody likes to eat at uh, Texas Roadhouse. It's my favorite restaurant, but not everybody likes Texas Roadhouse. There are some people just as happy to eat at McDonald's. Some people just as happy to eat at Burger King or just as happy to eat at Wendy's. Go ahead, go to your fast food church. Go to your church where all they do is play games and play cake and help you to feel like you've scratched your religion itch for the week. Because, honey, that ain't the kind of church we're looking to build around here. No, we're looking to have a place where the Spirit of God is literally going to fall like He did on the day of Pentecost. We're looking to have a place where people who are sick in body will be able to come and through faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll be able to receive their healing. Where people who are bound by devils and deception, 
Those who are bound by addiction will be able to come and receive instantaneous, glorious deliverance. That's what we're looking to do here. Oh, a certain man made a great supper. Oh, I'll tell you what, many, many Christians in our world today don't appreciate what could be. A lot of Christians in our world today, they go to their churches, they get preached into a froth. They get preached angry. They get preached angst-filled. Mm -hmm. And they're happy to do it. They think that is what God wants for His church. Well, honey, you keep going there and feeding on the pig's food. <laughs> we don't serve that here. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We don't serve that here. That's not on the menu here. Glory to God. I'm not trying to send you out of this place angry. I'm not trying to send you out of this place hating anybody. I'm not trying to send you out of this place with a political mission or having been instructed how to vote or which party to belong to. That's not our mission. You leave this place, you will have been encouraged to love people. You will have been encouraged to try to understand people. You will have been encouraged to exercise empathy, to show sympathy. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. Not to sneer and make a comment under your breath when you see some poor homeless drug addict but rather to bow your head in prayer for them and ask God somehow, some way to help them and to find them and to meet them and pull them out of that hole they're in. Hallelujah. That's what I do when I'm driving. We don't have here in Alabama, we don't have the number of homeless people on every street corner like they do in Texas. But in Texas, you can't hardly stop at an intersection but that there aren't at least one or two different homeless people on either corner begging for money, hoping somebody will give them something. And when I see these people, the thought goes through my mind. My grandmother, when I was a kid, my grandmother constantly used to say the old saying, Oh, but for the grace of God, there go I. And I see these people and I say, Jesus, help them, Lord. Somehow God reached out and touched them and helped them to find you. Help them to find a walk with you. Because when you find the Lord, honey, I'm here to tell you, you will find blessing. When you find the Lord, you will find divine favor. When you find the Lord, you will find a life that's worth living. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Too many people live their lives making excuses for not doing those things they know they ought to have done. What they do not realize is that an excuse is not a reason. A reason, listen to me, is reasonable, meaning it can be reasoned out and it will make perfect sense. An excuse does not carry the same standard as a reason. For instance, in our primary text, <laughs> the first man receives an invitation to this great supper and look at the reason he gives for his inability to attend. He said, I bought a piece of ground and I must, I must, I must 
needs go and see it. Really? You must? On a Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, you must? At the exact moment that that party's going on, you must! At the very time that the dinner is being served, you must go inspect this property. Really? You must? I'm going to tell you, there is nothing in the world aggravates me more than somebody offering me an excuse and calling it a reason. That You want to aggravate me, you want to get me upset, stand there and tell me why you couldn't do something. And the excuse you're offering as a reason why you couldn't do it is nothing more than an excuse. Well, Pastor, how do you know it's an excuse? I'll tell you how I know it's an excuse. If it cannot be reasoned out and make perfect sense, then it is not a reason. It is an excuse. If you could have done that at a different time, then it is an excuse, not a reason. Many LGBT people, for instance, will offer as a reason for their not going to church and not being a part of what God is doing and what the Lord is trying to do. And their reason is, well, I was mistreated in church. I had somebody really do me dirty. I had people treat me poorly. I was thrown out of my church. I was asked to leave my church. That's why I can't go back to church. Really, you can't, can you? No, it's not a matter of you can't. It's a matter of you won't. Because there ain't nobody standing in front of this door telling you you can't come in. There ain't nobody in this building who's going to ask you to leave. Hello now. That's right. Well, bless God, I left the church because people treated me bad. And they said this and they did that and blah, blah, blah. And that's the reason. No, it's not. That's your excuse. Was that the only church on the planet? Could you not find another? How much time did you devote to finding another church? Hello now. You see... We love to offer excuses and call them reasons. I want to tell you a little secret, my friend. One day you will stand before God in the judgment. And you're going to peel off all your reasons for ignoring His call. You're going to peel off all your reasons for not doing the things that you knew were right to do and good to do and beneficial for your soul and beneficial to your walk with God and you're going to stand there before the God of all the ages and you're going to list all your reasons and the Spirit of God is going to respond by saying to you I have not heard one legitimate reason all I have heard is a list of excuses. Oh my Lord have mercy. Am I telling the truth today? The other man said, I bought oxen and I'm going now to test them and try to, um, you know something? You're pretty foolish to buy oxen without having tested them first. It's an excuse. Who's going to buy oxen without making sure they can do what you need them to do before you buy them? Hello now. Oh, but you see, we make up our reasons. We make up our excuses and we think the other guy is just dumb enough to buy what we're saying. I used to have a guy in our church in Dallas, bless his heart, I don't know a human being on this planet made me quite as crazy as he did. I never knew a human being in my life who could make up excuses like he could make up excuses. And honestly, they were some of the dumbest excuses I ever heard in my life. He didn't even try to make them sound good. He didn't even try to make them sound plausible.
when somebody says they could not go to a wedding because they stubbed their toe that morning and it just hurt too bad for them to be able to go to the wedding. Mm, yeah, that's a good reason. I couldn't go to the wedding because I stubbed my toe. <laughs> it hurt. Well, how long does the toe that you stub generally hurt for? A little bit, then the pain goes away by telling the truth. See what I'm saying about uh, employing reason? You just reason it out. It don't make sense if you reason it out. But now if somebody said I was driving to the wedding and the bridge I had to cross was washed out, well, <laughs> and unfortunately there was no alternate route available to me. Well, guess what? There's a reason. There's a reason. There excuse is legitimate am I telling the truth because when you reason it out it makes perfect sense there is nothing about it that is not plausible that is not truthful oh I'm going to tell you obviously when we offer a reason it is not the same as an excuse many people think their excuses will carry weight in eternity well, Lord, I never went back to church because it was too full of hurtful hypocrites and hateful people. Well, that may sound like a reason, but it is in fact nothing more than an excuse. Is the church that they attended the only church in the area? Is that the only church you could have attended? That one church full of hypocrites and hateful people? Is that the only church on the planet? Did someone physically injure them so badly that they had a broken back and were confined to bed, unable to physically get up and go to church? That would be a reason. You understand what I'm telling you today? In the story, the biblical story of the unprofitable servant, the one servant offered an excuse as to why he did nothing but bury his master's money. Whereas the other two offered reasons as to why they did invest his money so they could return to him more than he had given to them. Notice the same reason they gave for taking action was the same exact thing the last servant offered as an excuse for not taking action. I knew thee. I knew thee that thou were a hard man that you sowed, that you reaped where you had not sown and you follow. Two of the servants said, for that reason, I knew to invest your money. The third guy said, I knew they said the same exact words. He said, and for that reason, I did nothing. I took your money and I buried it. My Lord, have mercy. The difference between reason and excuses. The same reason they gave for taking action was the same Language used by the last servant in offering an excuse for not having done so. His own fears are what prevented him from acting. There was no legitimate reason for his doing nothing. Nothing prevented him or stood in the way of his investing the monies that his master had given him as the other two had done. It was only his own fear that motivated him to make excuses rather than to act upon reason. Folks, how in the world do we expect that on the day of judgment we are going to be able to make excuses and somehow calm the Lord into letting us into glory in spite of our not having done our part in this life to be made a partaker of the glories of God. Are we so fickle and self-deceived 
that we actually think our weak and baseless reasons, excuses, I'm sorry, will somehow bamboozle the God of all creation? People often blame the Lord for poor life experiences and difficulties in this world. They'll do everything in their power to lay the fault at the Master's feet for all their woes and troubles. Yet the promise of God's word is this. Matthew 6.33 But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. When you're challenged by the word of God as you read this passage or hear it preached, how often do we offer up all kinds of excuses as to why we were unable to fulfill the requirement of pursuing our relationship with the Lord, firstly and above all else. You see, the reality is, my friend, excuses are based solely upon, listen carefully, excuses are based solely upon priority. That's what it boils down to. Every excuse that we offer is based solely upon priority. Has nothing in the world to do with anything else. I bought a piece of land and I must go inspect it. In other words, that is a higher priority to you than going to this supper. Well, I bought oxen and I must go test them. Really, it's a matter of priority. To you, it's more important that you go right now, right this minute, and test those oxen than to go to this feast that your friend has spent a great deal of money and effort preparing so you could be included in it. I just got married. I can't go. I've taken a wife. When I left my first church that I started 40 years ago, I started nearly my first church. When I left that church, the Church of God appointed a man to pastor it after me. He was a young man. He had a wife. They had been married for maybe a couple of years. I had gone through the internship program in the Church of God, and this young man followed me. He and his wife were going through the same program in the same exact church that I had done it in, under the same pastor that I had worked with. And they assigned him, after I left, they assigned him to the church that I left. That church was strong. That church had dozens and dozens and dozens of people we had over a hundred people it was in the top 10 churches in the entire district out of 42 or 43 churches we were in the top like 10 it was not even two years old and then one of the members called me one day June she stayed in touch with me after I left. Many of the people did. She said, Brother Charles, she said, I'm so upset. She said, the fellow they appointed to pastor after you left has resigned. He said he can no longer perform the duties of a pastor. I said, why on earth? And she said, well, they, they just had their baby. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> she, what, what, what was that? She said, well, you know she was pregnant. You know she was expecting. Well, she just had her baby. And I said, uh-huh. Do you know how many pastors I know that have had children while they're pastoring? Do you know how many preachers I know have had children while they were at the head of a church, many of them pastoring much bigger churches than that one. Was that fellow's reasoning legitimate or was it an excuse? Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today, folks? Mm -hmm. 
sadly the fault for many believers woes does not lay at the feet of the Lord but rather it rests squarely upon their own shoulders he has promised seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you it's about priorities is your walk with God a priority is your relationship with the master a priority is the kingdom of God a priority if it is then God has promised blessing and favor in your life. But if you're not experiencing those things, don't you dare look at God and blame Him. He's told you how to achieve them. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in that evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Most believers go through life and they're lucky if they have a shred of the armor of God on their body to protect them in this spiritual war we must fight trying to maintain our faith in this life. They don't do those things which are necessary to nurture the fabrics which constitute our protection from evil influences and satanic attacks. See, the armor of God didn't just magically appear. You don't just, oh, hey, there's the breastplate of righteousness. Let me put it on. Hey, there's the preparation of the gospel. Let me put it on. Hey, there's the shield of faith. Let me pick it up. No, it's not how it works. Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You want the shield of faith? I'm going to tell you something. You need to be in a place where you can hear the word of God preached. That is the method God has designed. That is the method God has prescribed for our faith to grow and for us to be in possession of faith. It is through the hearing, through the hearing, through the hearing, not reading. You can read all day and all night. But it is through the hearing of the word of God that faith is established and maintained and grows. The breastplate of righteousness hinges also upon our faith. Why? Because New Testament righteousness is born of faith in Romans 1 17 for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith 
as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Galatians 5 and 5 For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Philippians 3 and 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Hebrews 11, 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. There's a reason God designed our faith to operate as it operates. There is a reason why we are called to be part of the church and to actively engage with other believers. Why we're called to submit ourselves to spiritual leadership and godly authority. A reason why we're called to congregate with other believers. Faith is the key to all we possess through Jesus Christ. And faith requires the preached word of God mm. if it is to grow. So do you see why the church is so important? Do you see why? Because, honey, this is where you get the armor. This is where you get the material you need in order to make the armor that you need to wear. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today. Fellowship and communion with the people of God is how we find encouragement to act right and to do the right things. If we try to walk outside of the fellowship of God's church, we are missing an integral ingredient to a productive and blessed relationship with our God. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 and let us consider one another to provoke one, excuse me, to provoke unto love and to good works. So Paul is saying, we, we need to literally be encouraging and inspiring one another to love and to do good things. Look at the next verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, meaning encouraging one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. In Romans 10, 11 through 15, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why are we an LGBT affirming church? I just read to you why. Because whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Because the Lord, the same Lord is rich over all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's why. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. 
Many believers call themselves disciples of Christ, followers of the Lord Jesus. And yet they fail to embrace the, dis the discipline which is called for by the Master himself. A disciple is not one who merely follows, but one who embraces the disciplines set forth by their leader. That's right. How many Christians do you know today who brag about their Christianity and yet they lack the disciplines called for in the Word of God like loving their neighbor, showing mercy and compassion? Hello now. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 6, last passage today. Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, and dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it. For it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Folks, I'm closing right now. Are your reasons for not serving the Lord today legitimate reasons? Or are they merely excuses? Mm. Are your reasons for not being part of a church? Are your reasons for not making your way to the house of God and embracing that as a discipline? Do you realize when people go to church every Sunday and they make a habit of that, they make a ritual of that, that is something they do consistently, constantly, that is what we call a discipline. They don't let anything else come before their obligation to the house of God. Why? Because of priorities. <clears throat> because in the end, Every excuse is really based on priorities. Mm -hmm. Are your reasons today legitimate or are they just excuses? Will they stand up in the courts of heaven or will they crumble like straw in the presence of God's sacred flame? Why do we continue to try and do things our own way when the Lord has clearly prescribed a way for us to not only live eternally in His presence, but also to experience a good and a blessed life while yet walking here on earth. Will we one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say, Lord, I did my best. Or will we, like so many, say, Lord, excuse me? Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord.